Good afternoon and welcome to History Now, a special presentation of the Alabama Department of Archives and History on the 65th anniversary commemoration of the Montgomery Bus Boycott. My name is Scotty Kirkland and I serve as the Exhibits, Publications and Programs Coordinator for the Alabama Archives. We have a full program today, so let me quickly just invite you back virtually next Thursday, December 17th, two Thursdays from now, December 17th at noon for our final Food for Thought presentation of the year. Archives Director Steve Murray will be the featured speaker presenting on the life and work of his predecessor, Thomas McAdory Owen, the founder and first director of the Alabama Department of Archives and History. For today's program, we are thrilled to welcome our panelists and as we discuss perspectives on the history of the boycott. Our first panelist, Joseph Caver, is the former senior archivist at the Air Force Historical Research Agency at Maxwell Air Force Base here in Montgomery. Some time ago, he was an archivist for this agency and now serves on the board of directors for our support organization, the Friends of the Alabama Archives. Dr. Caver is a lecturer at Alabama State University, and he's the author of a newly published book, From Marion to Montgomery, The Early Years of Alabama State University. Thank you, Joe. 1867 to 1925. Dr. Caver will return in the new year to discuss his book, with us. So you'll look forward to that a book published right here in Montgomery by New South Books. Also joining us today is Dr. Jean Theo Harris, Distinguished Professor of Political Science at CUNY Brooklyn College. Dr. Theo Harris is the author of nine books on civil rights and black power movements and the politics of race and education. Her book, The Rebellious Life of Mrs. Rosa Parks, won a 2014 NAACP Image Award. And more recently, her 2018 book, A More Beautiful and Terrible History, The Uses and Misuses of Civil Rights History, was awarded the Brooklyn Public Library's Literary Prize for Nonfiction. And just this week, we learned that Beacon Press, uh, her publisher for both of these books, uh, is announcing the forthcoming publication of an adaptation of her Rosa Parks biography for younger readers. So congratulations on that, Dr. Theo Harris. Uh, I'd like actually to start with you with our first question, Dr. Theo Harris. Uh, so much of what is remembered in the public narrative about the Montgomery bus boycott centers on Rosa Parks. Uh, you know, there are, there are two statues here in Montgomery to Parks uh, and a third in her honor plan for the grounds of the Alabama State Capitol. But you, you've written before about how the the commemorations around the boycott, the, the way the boycott is remembered, sort of traps Rosa Parks on yeah. December 1st, 1955. As one of her biographers, what, what do you think it's important to remember about Parks and her life beyond December 1955? Um, thank you. And it's so great to be here um, and to be kind of marking the 65th anniversary of the beginning of the Montgomery bus boycott of Mrs. Parks' stand. I mean, I think like you were saying, everyone knows Rosa Parks, and yet much of what we know about Rosa Parks is actually very incomplete, distorted, and at times really wrong. Um, so she's not old, she's not tired, she's not meek, and she's not a one to wonder. Um, she has a life history of being rebellious. That's how she puts it. Um, that begins decades before her bus stand. Um, really, she gets her start um, when she, uh, with her husband, with Raymond Parks, who she describes as the first real activist I ever met doing organizing around the Scottsboro case. Uh, so that's in the early 1930s. Um, by the 1940s, she wants to be more, even more active. And she sees a picture in the, the local black newspaper of a local NAACP meeting that has a woman in it that she knew from middle school. And that's Johnny Carr. And she she realizes women can be part of the branch and she goes to her first meeting in 1943. Um, and she will spend the next dozen years alongside Johnny Carr, alongside Edie Nixon, transforming Montgomery's NAACP into a more activist chapter, um, working on issues of voter registration, working on issues that we would call criminal justice issues. So both cases where black people and particularly black men are being wrongfully accused of crimes and also trying to make the law actually bring justice for black um, people who had been victims of white brutality and particularly black women 
who had faced sexual violence. Um, and so they do all of this work in this decade before she makes her historic bus stand, trying to get justice for black women, trying to um, get people registered to vote, right? There are all of these barriers to voter registration, some of which we continue to see today. Um, so, and she talks about this decade, right? She says, it was hard to keep going when all our efforts seemed in vain. So to me, one of the worst things we do in terms of thinking about the courage she's going to show on December 1st, 1955 on the bus when she's coming home from work is that we miss how many stands she had made before, how many stands others of others that she was organizing with had, had made before, right? There is nothing to suggest that night, Thursday night, December 1st, 1955, when she makes the decision, right, to resist James Blake's order to get to, to, you know, to have to give up her seat, right? When she says, pushed as far as I could stand to be pushed, she says, if I got up, I would be approving of this treatment, I felt, and I did not approve, right? And so she refuses. But I think part of what is courageous in that, that we don't fully reckon with, is that courage of perseverance, that courage of being able to do th something over and over and over, right? Not necessarily because you can see what it's going to do, but because a line is a line and you have to kind of draw it. Um, and we can talk more. She then will have 40 more years after the bus boycott's successful end. The parks, she loses her job during the boycott. Her husband loses his job. It's a tremendous hardship on the Parks family. Uh, and that hardship will last for a decade, right? So Parks is suffering. And then she's gonna spend 40 years in Detroit continuing that activism um, in and alongside a growing black power movement. She will describe Malcolm X as her personal hero. She will keep going in the 70s and the 80s in the 90s till the end of her life. She says the movement's not over. Um, so I think that the, the most important thing to see about Rosa Parks is this huge history uh, of being rebellious. Thank you. Thank you for that, Dr. Theo Harris. I want to bring in uh, Joe Caver here. Uh, Dr. Caver, earlier in your career, you processed, I believe, some of the archival material that was left behind from the Montgomery Improvement Association. This material is held at Alabama State University. Uh, beyond the well-known participants like Rosa Parks and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., uh, tell us a little bit about some of the other local people who really made the boycott a success, some of the other names uh, that, that we should uh, remember to call forth during this 65th anniversary. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Scott. Uh, let me tell you about my uh, uh, involvement with the Montgomery Improvement Association first, and then I get to the collection. Uh, I received a call from Mrs. Johnny Carr, had to be 1995, 1996. And the call was concerning the Greyhound bus station. And of course, after the uh, massive bombing in uh, Oklahoma City, uh, GSA was looking to make uh, the federal courthouse safer and they was going to build another one. So I, uh, I think Judge Myron Thompson called Mrs. Carr, Mrs. Carr called me around the Williams. So we went on the board basically to work on preserving the Greyhound bus station to commemorate the Freedom Riders of 1961. Okay, so I'm on the board and then we realized uh, the papers had not been organized and collected. So Mrs. Carr asked me to gather the papers and it was decided that Alabama State uh, Archives, Alabama State University Archives would uh, hold the papers and manage them. So I began the roundup uh, of the collection. There were some in a warehouse in downtown Montgomery and some uh, at a office on Edgemont Avenue. Uh, the MIA through the years have had many leaders and Leaders took papers here and took paper there. Uh, I collected the papers, uh, which consists of 12 linear feet of information, but I was surprised to find there was very little about uh, 1955 and 1956, the time of the Montgomery bus boycott. <laughs> but the collection that I 
uh, put together and organized was from about 1957 forward, and it contains financial files, correspondence, mass meeting records, contributions, acknowledgement. But one that stood out was the Highlander Folk School, and I want to come back to that because the young lady before me, uh, Mrs. Parks, had gone to the Highlander Folk School uh, with uh, the Durs. Uh, as you know, the Highland and the Folk School in Montego, Tennessee, I believe, grew out of the labor movement of the uh, 30s and became an activist in civil rights, Dr. King. So she had gone through the training on how to react in a situation. And so that's why she was prepared to be arrested uh, at that bus station because of training that she had proceed, received at the Howell Island Folk School and also her participation in the NACP. But the other discovery that I made while trying to organize was that there was a AUM professor that worked at Auburn Montgomery from 1972 to 1980. And he had gone to many of the leaders of the uh, Montgomery Improvement Association and they had loaned or uh, lent papers, official papers to Mr. Rayburn. Uh, he collected these and he left AUM and got a job at Penn State University. He took the papers with him and they are in the Jack Rayburn collection uh, on Alabama civil rights and Southern activism. So here we are, I'm organizing the papers. I brought this to the attention of the board and the board said, well, what should we do? Well, we called in our uh, distinguished attorney, Fred Gray, who had represented the MIA from 55 forward. And he knew nothing about the papers being given to Mr. Rayburn. We wrote to the university and they said they had a deed of gift from Mr. Rayburn and therefore they had the legal instrument. Uh, we also were aware of uh, the Boston University case with uh, the King family and how Boston University sent those papers to the King Center because of that lawsuit. Yet, we did not follow up. By 2005, at the 50th anniversary, it rose up again. Oh, by the way, that's what we heard the, uh, <laughs> well, how should I say, mind-boggling speech of uh, a senator from Illinois, uh, Barack Obama. He stole the show at the 50th anniversary of the Montgomery a bus boycott. So getting off message here. <laughs> but uh, we again wrote to Penn State seeking the papers. And of course, they said they had the right to these very valuable uh, Montgomery uh, Improvement Association documents that was uh, managed in Montgomery bus boycott. Uh, as an alternative, they agreed, I believe, to send microfilm copies to Alabama State University I'm not sure they have them, but uh, the state archives also need to get a copy of those files. Uh, these are the primary source documents used to manage the Montgomery bus boycott, and they are located at Penn State University instead of here in Montgomery, Alabama, where the bus boycott originated. Uh, Scott, did I answer your question, or is there something else you want me to, to discuss there? I went off. No, you did. Thank you. That's okay. That's all right. Um, I, I actually uh, I want to bring in uh, both of you here to to follow up on uh, on this point. You know, uh, commemorating uh, civil rights anniversaries in particular can sometimes be uh, complicated because it's a difficult task to boil down these complex events that have uh, usually a long uh, prehistory to them, and there's a lot of agency. Uh, to unpack. And Dr. Theo Harris, you, you wrote a book which in part explores the dangers of having this too simplistic a view uh, of movement figures, uh, parts included in Dr. Caver. You're obviously, as we've heard, you know, a student of the movement and a longtime resident of Montgomery. Uh, so I wonder, what are the things that both of you believe are important to keep in mind as we look for perspective on this anniversary of the bus boycott? And uh, Dr. Theo Harris, I'd like you to go first, please. Well, thank you. Um, so I think, I mean, I am, as you, as you just mentioned, somebody who sort of wants us to take apart the fable a little bit 
um, because I think the fable clouds our ability both to see what the Montgomery bus boycott was, but also the lessons it offers us for today, right? Um, and so I wanted to maybe talk about two or three aspects of the fable that I think um, we would do well to kind of complicate. Um, I think the first way we tend to learn the, the Montgomery bus boycott story is she sits down, somehow people rise up, and then it just somehow wins, right? And I think that misses, right, as you were saying, the long organization beforehand, but also the immense organization of the Montgomery bus boycott as it's going on. I think there's this image of the Montgomery bus boycott that it's all about walking. And absolutely, people do a lot of walking, but how they sustain a 382 day boycott is by this incredibly well-organized, black organized carpool system, right? Where they set up 40 stations all around Montgomery where you can get a ride to the doctor, to work, back home. Um, and that they're giving 10 to 15,000 rides a day, right? This is a massive system. It's also massively harassed by the city and by police. They're getting ticket after ticket after ticket after ticket. Joanne Robinson, right, the head of the Women's Political Council, who really is the one who kind of calls the boycott, she gets like 17 tickets in the first couple of months, right? There's massive harassment of it, right? Because the city is trying to break the boycott. Um, I think a second myth, and this is always one that I like just to make sure to overturn, which is the two most famous pictures of Rosa Parks being her mugshot and that picture of her fig being fingerprinted are not, let me say that again, are not from December 1st, 1955. That's right. They're constantly misattributed in museums, in books, right? because of our idea, right, that this, you, that you know in the moment that it's a history changing event. So there's somehow press there. There is no press there. <laughs> if there was a mugshot taken, right, it, we don't know where it is. Um, and that both of those actually come from February, 1956, when 89 boycott leaders are indicted. Um, and people like Parks and Nixon, don't, they're not gonna wait to get brought in. They organize a whole group of people to go down to present themselves at the police station with all sorts of members of the community behind them outside um, to basically say, you know, I heard you wanted us, we are here, right? As this show of community support because what the city's trying to do with those indictments is break the back of the boycott. And, um, and, that, and they don't. Right, and so that picture of her being fingerprinted is from that. Her mugshot is from that. Um, and then I, could, I would say the third thing is that I think the righteousness of the boycott and the importance of the boycott to us today seems so obvious, right? Um, that we've I think really papered over both kind of what it was. So it was it was a disruptive boycott. It was meant to be disruptive. It was meant to bring the city and the bus company to its knees. Right. And so I think sometimes we airbrush the disruption out of the civil rights movement. Um, King is adamant about the importance of disruption. Right. Parks is adamant. Johnny Carr is adamant. Right. Um, the second thing is that the national news media is paying no attention to very little attention. It is only after the indictments. Right. That you see national newspapers like The Washington Post and The New York Times actually send reporters to Montgomery. Right. So this idea that we have. Right. Of the kind of obviousness misses the work, misses the organizing, misses the fact that like you change history, not because it's it's clear what's ahead, but because they're just taking step after step after step after step, right? And I think that helps us because I think that helps us imagine both how we do it today. And I think it also, I one of the things I've been very troubled with and I've written about um, is the ways that we tend to pit the civil rights movement against contemporary movements like Black Lives Matter and really miss the kind of commonalities and really miss the ways that, um, that, that part of what the civil rights movement did was make people uncomfortable, right? 
And and I think that's one of the lessons that we can draw from the Montgomery bus boycott in terms of how we take it forward and and the kind of work for for kind of social justice today. Right. Dr. Caver, jump in. Uh, what do you think are some of the perspectives that we should keep in mind on the 65th anniversary? Uh, well, I was publication. I can't cover it now. Uh, uh, Montgomery Black Police Memoirs. And he talked about what he witnessed during those 382 days uh, within the community. Uh, I should be able to identify uh, his wife was a former church member. But he said, he said in the book that crime just almost disappeared for a year. Uh, you're cutting, you're shooting, your dice games. Uh, so that told me that there was a complete buy-in by the black community and it shows up in their behavior uh, uh, that uh, uh, I was amazed to see this. And so did this black, black police officer at the time, uh, behavior of the community, how everyone, uh, rich, poor, middle class, west side, east side, south side, north side, Everybody bought into it and their behavior changed. The cuttings, the shootings, the violence that uh, has been with, uh, within the black community for generations and still continues to uh, looking at the murder rate here in Montgomery. Uh, but what that move that Mrs. Parks and now Dr. King, Edie Nixon, Joanne Robinson, the Women Political Council. The influence they had is, uh, uh, I would like to go back and take another look at that and go through the daily newspaper. I'm sure they will record the crime reports uh, uh, and see if what this black police officer said is true. That that stands out to me and it also shows uh, the buy-in and the commitment of the community to call for walking 10 miles, uh, picking up someone, taking them to their jobs or going continuing to life as is, but the behavior change is something that needs to be looked at. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Caber. Uh, before we move on to the next portion uh, <laughs> and, of the program. And I was wait. also. Go ahead, uh, go ahead, Joe. I'm sorry, we have a bit no, of a delay. Uh, to commemorate uh, Mrs. Park for working at Mountain Space, I'm sorry. Uh, it's good. Uh, as you know, I spent 30 years as an archivist at the Historical Research Agency, right. and we tried to find the information. Apparently, they uncovered her work and I say a singers and they have now put up a, a marker, a monument, uh, which I need to go see uh, to commemorate that. But she, there were other black women. She was the perfect. She fit what Edie Nixon and uh, uh, the other leaders at that time was looking for. And I remember meeting Mrs. Park several times. And I don't know, maybe I'm old fashioned, but every time I met her, she was so gentle. It, it, she gave me an impression she had an aura around her head that she was an angel. And she never read her voice, but when she's words, she's uh, it made you think it had an uh, impulse. So I'm not saying that she was an angel, but it, it appeared to me when I came in contact with her, uh, she was indeed a special person. Thank you. <laughs> sure. Sorry. Sorry for stepping on you there, Joe. We've, we've got a little bit of a delay. Um, I want to encourage Thank our you. viewers to go ahead and post their own questions. Uh, for our panelists in the comment section. At the end of the program, we'll have time to, to get to some of those. Uh, of course, our anniversary this year comes amidst uh, an ongoing pandemic, and that will naturally affect planning for uh, the public events that we're going to have. But I'd like to bring in the conversation now, uh, our final pan panelists, to discuss the commemoration. Ashley Jernigan is the owner of JDB Hospitality, LLC. Uh, Jernigan's firm is dedicated to building brands of people, places, and products through corporate event management, community relations, and business consulting. And Ashley is the lead planner for Montgomery's commemoration 
of the 65th anniversary uh, of the bus boycott. I should add too that Ashley is a newly minted member of our Friends of the Archive Board as well. So Ashley and Joe, I think we need one more for a quorum uh, and then we can <laughs> conduct some business. Uh, Ashley was in the foxhole with us for a lot of the events during the last part of the bicentennial. And uh, Ashley also, I believe, was uh, took point on the John Lewis commemorations when he uh, when his body lay in state uh, in July here at the state capitol. So, Ashley, a final want uh, to uh, want to bring you in and welcome you and talk to us a little bit about the plans that the city has for this commemoration, uh, both online and safely throughout Montgomery. Yes. Um Thank you so much for allowing me to uh, jump in and be able to kind of update everyone on where we are. Um, and so to, to add to the conversation of what uh, has been said previously, we have really focused uh, with the city and with Montgomery Improvement Association and with the county and with several other partners, a way to create a collaborative effort event schedule. Uh, and so at mgmbusboycott.com, you can see the entire list of things that we have going on through the seventh, uh, but to give you a couple of ideas of what we have so far and for the rest of the week, um, both EJI's Legacy Museum and Rosa Parks Museum are offering free admission for you to be able to go through not only the museum, but also through their exhibits that they have. Um, the Legacy Museum has a um, MGM Bus Boycott exhibit, so that's pretty amazing. You'll have an opportunity to go there. Uh, tomorrow, same is what we're doing. If you'll see, if you go to mgmbusboycott.com right now, uh, one thing that they both mentioned, uh, both doctors mentioned when we were talking was that the need for people to understand everything that really happened and everyone who was really involved in making the boycott a success. And so if you go to the website, you'll see a sites page and that page keeps growing because honestly, I keep learning. But that sites page lists different places throughout the city, people and places throughout the city that played a major part in the success of the boycott. Uh, I learned about the Al Posey parking lot, uh, where it was a main hub for allowing pat black passengers to be able to get around to where they needed to go. And so you'll be able to go there. And when you go around the city, I want people to be a tourist in their own town. And if you're coming to visit here, to go look at those sites section and go visit all those locations, read the historical markers on every single area. There's also an option for you to be able to learn more. There's a link that takes you to another website just to get to know more about each one of these sites. Uh, because what's really important for us, uh, not only for the next seven days, but for the next 382 days and beyond, is that everybody gets a full picture of what's happening uh, and what happened um, in 65 years ago. So fast forward to Saturday, it's going to be an amazing day, and I hope that everyone can come out. And you mentioned virtually a lot of things you can imagine uh, was in person that has moved to virtual, but that allows for opportunity for creativity. And so from that, uh, Mayor Reed um, tasked me with finding a team to be able to create a documentary about organizing for the future. It's called 382, Organizing for the Future. And we are going to have a drive-in Saturday night at Patterson Field parking lot uh, where we'll have popcorn available uh, and some food and music leading up to it. It starts at 5 o'clock. You can drive right in. We'll have people there make sure that everybody has a proper place to park. The, at from 5, about 6.15, we'll start the actual film. But it is about an hour and 15 minutes, and it is amazing. And what they did is um, talked about the similarities of what's happening right now. So it's not uh, simply a history lesson. It's so much more than that. So I hope that anyone and everyone can come out to that drive-in and experience um, what we've been working on for months. Uh, prior to the drive-in on Saturday, we also have uh, Kevin King, who's with King's Campus, is having a block party slash capital campaign. And really what he's doing is he is going to bring light to one of the neighborhoods that was also vital, very um, prominent black neighborhood that he wants to revitalize. And he wants to bring more businesses back and create a, a black business corridor. And so we want to bring people there to see what he's doing and see what other businesses are doing and to begin to know how they can support bringing back that area that was hit hard uh, during after leading past the the, the boycott. After that, uh, Michelle Browder with More Than Tours at 3.30 is, at three o'clock, I'm sorry, is having a, an event called Put Yourself in Their Shoes. And what that's going to be is not only a live art experience where you'll be able to, to purchase and actually create art 
uh, related to the boycott, but also Butler Browder, the son of Aurelia Browder, will be there to do a conversation and to talk about uh, his experience and his memories and things that he knows. And so we're, we're, we're just getting people to know, to learn more. And that's what our whole goal is, to learn more. So Saturday, 11 o'clock, King's Canvas, 3 o'clock, you go over to, to the I Am More Than campus on Martha Street. You can go to the website to get the exact location. And then 5 o'clock, uh, between 5 and 6 o'clock, you head over to the drive-in and you experience this amazing movie. I mean, I'm sure there'll be people that each of you know uh, and that you'll be loved to see. We have spoken word. We have music. It is, it is going to be amazing. Um, and then Monday, our last official day of the uh, citywide collaborative effort, is there's going to be a youth contest award show. The Montgomery City County Public Library System did a um, youth video contest that um, we had a bunch of submissions, so it was amazing. And what we did is we asked the youth, what does the boycott mean to you? What does that look like modern day? And we had some amazing videos, one that's 16 minutes long. So uh, it's really amazing. And we will be able to um, air who the winners were so we'll uh, be able to air that and anyone who can tune in, they can tune in and watch that and really see how the youth today are understanding what happened and their interpretation of what they can do now and moving forward to make a difference. So that's pretty amazing. And then we will finish it with Alabama State University's uh, annual uh, Abernathy lecture series. And so they are having a theme that's called They Were Not Afraid. It's a special pre a presentation that's highlighting the um, women, the founders, uh, and the families of the women political movement. And so I'm really excited about that. And they have a keynote speaker that is amazing. So again, everything that you need, you go to mgmbusboycott.com. And I hope I didn't go too fast, but that just allows you guys to just get an overview. And so you know, the December 7th, the collaborative efforts, as I call it, might be finished. But remember, this was 382 days and it's going to continue on the next year and the next year. And so I'm hoping that you will begin to see uh, a lot more that talks about not only the boycott, but other major points in history. And you will, and the city's actually partnered with Maxwell Air Force Base to help make that happen. So there'll be more to come. Ashley, thank, thank you. you all. That all sounds done great. Done. It's a good, good, uh, good start to what will hopefully be, like you say, 382 days of, right. of thoughtful commemoration. Uh, a final question from me for, uh, actually, all three of you, uh, before we turn to our viewer questions, uh, this program series that we're in right now is called History Now. Uh, and our intention of this program when we launched it uh, back in 2019 uh, was to explore the parallels of events in history with our current moment. Uh, in this age of Black Lives Matter and ongoing discussions about race in American society, I wonder what you all think uh, is the legacy of the boycott. What What lessons should people involved in civil rights and social justice work today, what lessons should they draw uh, from this history? Uh, and uh, Dr. Caver, I'd actually like to start with you if we could, please. I have... Okay, yeah. Um, I, at first I didn't realize Black Lives Matter was a national, international movement. It's the same comparable to what was going on here in Montgomery uh, in 1955 and the 60s. And the people living here, they didn't know it was a movement. In fact, they mounted uh, what we call massive resistance. And I see similar uh, activity going on with people who oppose Black Lives Matter. They simply do not understand the movement that's taking place right now has taken place before and will continue to take place again. Movement rises up and, it's, and most people do not understand what's going on. They just see uh, looting and protests and there is a movement and Black Lives Matter uh, uh, has, uh, I don't know how we're gonna label it say we can't call it the modern civil rights movement. It will be a continuation of this mm -hmm. movement. But uh, that uh, Black Lives Matter is a movement. It's not a group. It's not an organization. It's it, it's a movement that has uh, captured most people of color attention and many younger 
of Americans' attention as well as international attention. So uh, that's what uh, I will compare the Montgomery bus boycott and the modern civil rights movement and the Black Lives Matter movement as one of the same. Thank you. <laughs> Ashley, what are your thoughts on the perspectives here, the, the lessons? Oh, of if, for Ashley, the, pick up one of these, a driving tour. <laughs> definitely. Uh, I would say that for me, um, you said organizing. I think that um, with Dr. Theo Harris, we were talking before we went live. <laughs> I think that there is, there is such an amazing um, story around how do you organize for that long, right? And I think that it takes um, it takes a lot. It takes humility. It takes people knowing that they may not be the one that's directly out front, but they can play their part and they can be a part of it. And the one thing that I would really take from this that I want to see and that I've seen is that is a collaboration to join and make sure that when they, we want something to get done, we pull from all areas. We mentioned there's so many, as you said, there's SELC, there's SNCC, there was, there was the um, MIA, there was all these other organizations that came together and said, we must do this. And so what we really, I really am excited to see how these organizations are partnering together to organize, to make change immediately. Um, you may know with uh, Song Montgomery and a couple of other organizations got together and they really rallied and organized to get the names changed off of the Confederate names off the schools, right? That took major organizing. And I think that things that you can learn, and, and I hope to, to work with um, Dr. Theo Harris in the future, actually, with, with understanding how that organization happened and really digging deep into that and, and the modern day organizers taking those pieces banning together and really being able to create change. And we have already done it. We have already seen it. So now, as he said, it's not necessarily modern day. It's the continuation of, I would, I just, I love that we are at this precipice and we are just moving forward. And that would, it's definitely what I would take is the, the organization of being able to pull something off that as she stated, it crippled the city and the bus system. It made a dent. And when you touch people's pockets, people begin to look up and notice and see things. And I think that there's so much we can learn on how you do that and that immediate action and collaborating together, not just each individual organization doing their own thing. Dr. Theo Harris, would you like to follow up on that? Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's there are so many lessons. Um, I think the first sort of dovetailing from Dr. Caver's point is, is, um, is this real danger in making this distinction between kind of these good movements of the past and this movement today, right? And the ways that I think commentators tend to pit the civil rights movement against Black Lives Matter in really illegitimate ways, right? Um, and the ways that I think we airbrush how hard the civil rights movement was, how hard the Montgomery bus boycott was. Um, I think we have this we look back now and, and believe that sort of good, decent people, you know, supported the, like the bus boycott, the civil rights movement, and some did, but many didn't, right? When the movement was happening at the time, many, many Americans called it unreasonable. Dr. King was treated as unreasonable throughout the Montgomery bus boycott by city leaders. Uh, in Gallup polls, uh, if we go forward a few years, most Americans, in the week before the Montgomery uh, March on Washington, didn't approve of the March on Washington, right? So that I think one of the things we need to remember about this kind of profound change is the way that at the time it is hard, it is uncomfortable, it takes a tremendous amount of organizing, um, that many people are critical of it at the time. Mm -hmm. And then, but that part of the, the heroes we're talking about, and again, it's a much broader cast than we've gotten to talk about today. And I saw in the questions, right, people wanting to talk about Georgia Gilmore, people wanting to talk about, right, many of the women in Montgomery that make the bus boycott possible, both by staying off the buses, but also the tremendous fundraising. You can't have this incredible carpool system without a tremendous amount of fundraising. And, and people like Georgia Gilmore were pivotal to that fundraising. Um, so I think there's a huge ca cast of people, right, that are making this 382-day boycott possible. Um, I think the last thing I would say is 
I think sometimes we look back on our heroes and we think that there's something obvious, right? They know what to do at the time. And one of my favorite stories is, is from the morning of December 2nd, right? So the Women's Political Council has decided they're going to have a boycott on Monday, December 5th. They've like run off like 50,000 leaflets. Joanne Robinson calls Edie Nixon, right? Because Edie Nixon's one of the like key organizers in the city and Edie Nixon that morning starts to call the more political ministers in town, right? So he calls Ralph Abernathy and then he calls around 6 a.m. a 26 year old Martin Luther King, right? And King, uh, he's been in, the Kings have been in Montgomery for about a year at this point. They've just had their first baby, the y- Yolanda, she's three weeks old. Um, Nixon wakes her up, wakes them up. And like all of us, right, when somebody calls you and Nixon wants to use King's church for a meeting of the ministers that day. And like all of us, what did King say to Nixon? He says, you know, I need to think about it. Can you call me back? Um, And I pause there because I think we sometimes imagine people like Dr. King or people like Mrs. Parks as sort of, they're like, they know what to do. And there's like a neon sign saying, go here, do this, right? And I think What we can learn from this history also is there is nothing obvious about it, right? And and when Edie Nixon calls King back a few hours later, he says, yes, you can use my church. And, you know, we're going to see him take steps in the coming days and weeks to sort of step into this incredible leadership role. But there is nothing, nothing easy about it, foreordained about it, obvious about it, right? It takes making step after step after step, similar to Mrs. Parks, similar to Mrs. Carr, similar to Mrs. Gilmore, right? That this is this is people taking steps without an obvious place where it's gonna go, right? Um, and I think that's, to me, one of the most profound lessons, right? It's like, how do we summon our inner Rosa Parks to be able to act without necessarily knowing where it's gonna end? Right. Thank you. That was well said. Uh, Ashley, before we go to audience questions, I know that you had one more thing you wanted to mention. Yes, I had not. I wanted to make sure you knew there's actually there's one more event on Saturday. And when she was uh, speaking of people, it made me think about that Um, at Rosa Parks Museum at one o'clock. So eleven o'clock, you told your King's Canvas at one o'clock. The Rosa Parks Museum is having an event that is called Memories of the Movement, A Child's Perspective, featuring Meta Ellis, who's the daughter of Reverend and Mrs. Gratz. And so I think that that is, needs to definitely be put out there. Obviously, there's an opportunity for it to be um, streamed, that they will have that at the Facebook's um, Rosa Park Museum Facebook page. But it's going to speak about our personal experiences and talk about her as a child of during the movement. And I think that things like that, as she said, is, is pulling people in. There are people that are still alive today that are talking about this, that have these perspectives that we have to grab on and be a part of and learn from. And so I definitely don't want to to miss that. Is that at one o'clock? So 11, then one, then three, then five. You guys are busy on Saturday. So just <laughs> lock out the time and just know that you're going to be with us and with the boycott all day learning. And, and there's still fun parts about it. There's lots of foods. We're going to feed you. So yeah, please, uh, please enjoy and, and visit that as well. Thank you. All right. Thanks for that, Ashley. All right. Let's get a couple of our viewer comments up on the screen now uh, from Kathy. She says, how or why do you feel myths about Rosa Parks and the bus boycott? Uh, is, is that a danger that you feel could happen to folks involved in movements today? If so, any steps that people can take to prevent? Um, Go ahead. Dr. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think in terms of where it starts, it actually starts during the boycott itself. Um, and it starts during the boycott itself because we're in the midst of the Cold War. Um, and one of the things that happens in the first days and weeks in Montgomery's white community after the boycott starts is there are all of these rumors about those parks that snake through Montgomery's white community, that she's an NAACP plant, that she's a communist plant, that she's Mexican, that she has a car, that she's not even from Montgomery. Right. And at the base of these rumors is the idea that she is an outside agitator um, and that there's something kind of not indigenous about the protest. And so what you see happening is you start to see black newspapers, black leaders in Montgomery, even Mrs. Parks herself background her long political history. 
Um, and this is a paradox because part of why people rally behind Mrs. Parks, why she is the kind of test case they're looking for is because of her long political history, because people know she's brave. But that political history makes them vulnerable in, the, in terms of the Cold War. Um, we want to remember that six months after the boycott starts, the NAACP will be outlawed in the state of Alabama as a foreign organization, right? They're go I mean, one of the tactics after the Brown decision, both in the South and in the North, is, is, is um, painting civil rights activists as potential communist threats. So in some ways, that myth starts during the boycott itself where we start to see her long political history get backgrounded. They start to talk about her as a good Christian seamstress. We see that in the boycott itself. Now, obviously that begins to take on a life of its own. Um, and so to me, I think the danger and what we need to learn from today is both the ways that we like individuals and not talking about movements. And we have to be very careful about that, right? Um, and the constant bemoaning, I feel like around Black Lives Matter of like, we don't have a leader like Martin Luther King. and then really remembering that like in, in fact, part of what makes the power of the civil rights movement is that it's a leader full movement. Um, I think the second danger is, is this danger I think that I've been stressing, which is the ways that we like to backdate our admiration for things, right? Mm -hmm. And so I have no doubt that in 20, 30 years, Colin Kaepernick is going to be like, you know, celebrated like Muhammad Ali is in all, you know, from all corners of this country, right? And then everybody likes to make it seem like they always liked Muhammad Ali, right? Or they, you know, 20, 30 years that they always liked Kaepernick, right? They always stood with him. And I think we do that because we don't want, we're not always honest about um, when we don't step up, right? When we don't do, you know, um, you know, as King would put it, the appalling silence of our friends, right? That like, I think one of the other dangers is remembering, is remembering both how hard it is to, to take these actions, how hard it is to take these, to, to be courageous, right? And, and to also um, to kind of have to then grapple with a much harder history and therefore also a much harder present where, or where it's like, I think a more sobering look. Um, at ourselves as a country and yeah. Yeah, you know, it's, it's hard to, to, to compare the two events when, when we know the end of the story from what happened, you know, with the boycott, but we don't yet know, of course, the end of what's happening now. And sometimes it's, it, it's, it's easy to lose that perspective. I wanna put up another question uh, here. Uh, Tara White, uh, our friend, Dr. Tara White. Uh, what about uh, Rosa Parks' husband's work? Uh, yeah. she, she wants to talk about how we can also commemorate him as well. Oh, absolutely. Um, so I mentioned briefly, right? There's no way to talk about Rosa Parks' like long, long, long history of activism without the role that Raymond Parks plays, right? Uh, she meets him in 1931. She describes him as the first real activist I ever met. Um, Raymond is one of those local activists that has that have kind of come together. Um, uh, people remember the Scottsboro case, nine young men riding the rails, uh, like many people were doing in the Great Depression. Um, they get in a fight with some white boys. They actually best the white boys and sort of kick the white boys off the train. The white boys were also riding the rails for free too. The white boys go and get the police. Uh, the police come on the train it's in Scottsboro, Alabama, which is where then, like why it's called the Scottsboro case. Um, they arrest these nine young men. But as they're arresting these nine young men, uh, they find two young white women also riding the train for free. And that charge changes to rape. And those nine young men are quickly tried and all but the youngest who's 12 sentenced to death. And so a local movement grows in Alabama in 1931 to try to protect the Scottsboro boys from being executed. And one of those local activists is Raymond Parks. And that's what he's doing when she meets him in 1931. Right. And so in the first years of their marriage, he is the more public activist and she is more behind the scenes. And that's gonna really change over the course of their lives. And she will become the more public activist and he will be kind of more behind the scenes, right? But, but she is very clear right? Um, that 
of how important he was to her, but how, you know, and to like her quest for justice and her commitments. Um, I think also thinking about Maxwell um, and we heard, you know, kind of his history at Maxwell met, mentioned, right? He's working at Maxwell uh, when she makes her stand on the bus. And in fact, it is experiences at Maxwell, right? Because we want to remember Maxwell, uh, the military desegregates in 48. Um, and so you begin to see in the early 50s changes at Maxwell, where in fact, the transportation on the base is desegregated. And that's, you know, and so when she goes out there, um, he starts working at Maxwell, I want to say in like 53 or 54. And so when she goes out there to visit him, right, she's riding on the base in these on a desegregated kind of, right. Right. And so that's, yeah. that's pivotal. Um, sure. And so I think, sort of, I think similar to the ways that we often marginalize the wives of civil rights leaders, we see the marginalization of Raymond Parks as well. And I think, um, I appreciate the question because I think really remembering that like part of how she, Mrs. Parks is able to do the thing she is going to do and does, right, is because she has, a, you know, because the love of her life is also a kind of fighter for justice. Right. Yeah. That's important. And uh, I, um, I want to put up one comment that we have and get to this. Uh, Kathy McKay says, I appreciate the expanded picture of Rosa Parks' life and work, as well as more about the large grassroots effort. Um, actually, I was, I was very um, pleased to see uh, a couple of days ago when the marketing materials started rolling out for the commemorative anniversary, the uh, the, the names that were included, you know, it's, it's well beyond uh, just commemorating Parks or, or Dr. King or Reverend Abernathy. There's, there's a lot of movement people that are, that are uh, listed there. I think that's so important. Um, just talk to us actually one final, uh, one, one final minute about why it's important to you uh, as the organizer here to expand this view uh, beyond just Rosa Parks. Um, well, I think that um, Dr. Theo Harris said it, and so did Dr. Kaver Betts, is that if we see this as a sole person, two people movement, then we won't really uh, appreciate or understand or respect the level of um, coming together and organizing it took to make this happen. And when you start hearing these other names, they, they need to become just as naturally coming out of your mouth as the, as, as the two you mentioned. And how do we do that? We have to be at the forefront. We have to allow for cities like how the mayor has allowed for me and the county and MIA has allowed for me to be able to expand in the conversation um, and be able to say, okay, we are going to talk about this. That was one thing that I talked to them about. I said, so the agreement here is that we are going to talk about as many as we can. And we're going to show the, as large of a picture as we can. And we are going to say when we talk about the 65th anniversary of the Montgomery bus boycott, that we are going to teach people to uh, understand when I, you said grassroots, all of these people that came together to make this happen. And I hope to dedicate the rest of the year in doing that and really being able to let people understand. And that was the whole point of that site's page that I can tell based off even these conversations, it's gonna get bigger and bigger and bigger as I learn more and people come to me more about where where it happened, you know, all the way down uh, to different judges. There's just so many amazing things that I've learned and I'm still learning and um, and I love and I hope that people do the same thing. I hope that people then come to this site. I pulled from many different sites. And so I'm hoping they come and then they don't leave after the seven. Keep coming back to the site because there's going to be something else on there as we begin to expand and I begin to learn and I get the blessing of, of people like you all that begin to help me learn. Uh, and others about the entire movement. Great, great. All right, well, I think that we will enjoy looking over your shoulder, actually, as uh, as these commemorations unfold. We thank you for your work in, in preparing that. Uh, this is gonna conclude today's program, History Now, the Montgomery Bus Boycott in Perspective. A very special thanks to all three of our panelists, Dr. Joe Caver, uh, who left us for another appointment a few moments ago. Uh, Dr. Jean Theo Harris and Ashley Jernigan with JDB Hospitality. Uh, we thank you very much. We thank our panelists. We thank our viewers. Uh, and we ask you all to stay safe. Uh, and we will see you all very soon.
See you Saturday. Have a good day. <laughs> Have a good day.